Good morning, everyone, and welcome to session three of Graz Tage 2021. Our first talk today on this session is Ruby for the Win by Christoph Lippaus. If you have any questions um, during the talk, just write them into our IRC channel. You will find a link on our homepage um, to the chat server. I will then uh, replay, uh, relay those um, questions to Christoph at the end of the talk, and he will then um, answer those for you. So without further ado, um, Christoph, you have the word. Ahoy, this is uh, Ruby for the win for the Linux Target 2021. Uh, from a certain point of view, programming languages have a lot of similarities to choosing a tool for a certain job. So let's say programming languages are kind of tools. And with tools, um, they also have in common that they are created to, save, to solve some problem in a different, mostly more simple or elegant way than other tools do. Therefore, we might also say that the more tools you know, the better you know if you could save some time, effort, or sanity using something else. There's a good practice that ensures that we keep up studying. It states that we should learn at least one new programming language every year. If you study new concepts from time to time, it will not just enrich your tool set, it will also change your perspective on different problems. And it will help you figure out better solutions. Suppose you learn a new language, uh, then do not compare to what you currently are aware of, but try to figure out what the inventors of this tool were trying to solve. I'm Christoph, and I spend a lot of time building software. For the last decade, I tried to study at least one new programming language every year. And now I use a Go, sometimes Python, JavaScript, and some other tools on a daily basis. However, I'm especially grateful that I can spend a lot of time using Ruby. In this talk, I want to share with you some of my thoughts on Ruby. I picked up Ruby for the first time somewhere around 13 to 15 years ago, and it resisted to be the number one tool of choice for me. For the first part of this talk, I want to start with some facets that I really like. And as I think the best way to get to know something is to see it in action, I will do some live coding in the second part. After that, I will uh, close with pointing to some selected resources. And if there's some time left, we can also go for more code. In the final part, there's some extra time reserved for a question and answer session. Let's get started. Ruby is an interpreted object-oriented programming language that is known to focus on developer happiness. Uh, any Ruby software creator profits from code that, it easy, that is easy to read and easy to write. The important thing is that it is produced to be extra easy to read. Pretty easy to guess what the code snippet does, right? I could have also just read out the statement seven times print hello world and ask you what you think it will result to. Now this, this style of code can be attributed to the inventor and chief designer of the language. His name is Yokihiro Matsumoto and he's also referred to as Mats and he has a strong eye on the language structure and design. And it seems he's also responsible for the very nice community of Ruby. A widely known statement in the Ruby community 
is Mats is nice, so we are nice. And Rurikists tend to follow this mantra. I think I don't have to explain how valuable it is uh, to have a community that loves to share code, knowledge, and tends to be extra nice to each other. Rubyists are helpful and welcome you at any point. There are not many rules to follow when coding in Ruby, but a lot of good examples and best practices. After some time coding Ruby, the conventions, will give, the conventions given will just feel right. And several times uh, it happened to me that I've come up with almost the very same code to a problem that I later found written by someone else. And it is impressive to see how you learn to think in certain ways without being forced in a specific direction. This code snippet has a variable user and active suffixed with a question mark is sent to it. It is likely that you will expect true or false reading this line. The same goes to with the array assigned to a variable A below. The message clearly checks if two is a member of that array. Ruby allows you to use UTF-8 in your source code. So you can, as in the example, define methods that end with a question sign. And anytime you see such a method, you can for sure expect that it will return some value that evaluates to either true or false. This is no feature of the language, but this is the way the community sorted out would be a good style. And no one tells you to do that in, in this way. But now that you know about it, it will be very likely that you will write methods like this as well. The array 122 two responds with a new array 12 when unique is sent to it. Uh, the original array in the variable A is not changed. However, using the destructive method below will not create a new array, but change the existing one. It changes some internals, and this might not be expected. Therefore, it notifies the reader with the exclamation mark. So if a method ends with an exclamation mark, it will do something destructive, like in this case, it will change the internals of an object. In other cases, it could also raise an error if arguments or internals are, that are provided are not as expected. A nice correlation is that where everything in Unix is a file, everything in Ruby is an object. This line of code is extracted from a project um, that is using the popular web framework Ruby on Rails. When I started working with Ruby, one of the very first things that blew my mind was the way you can deal with time. As time handling was such a pain to me using other tools, I was really excited to see such an easy and elegant approach. This snippet uh, uses some database abstraction and queries all users that were created in the last three days. Or in other words, users were created at is greater than equal three days ago. For this presentation, I decided to build a package that offers this time handling from scratch. For sure in a very simplified version, but we should be able to we should have end um, being able to recreate this, this statement. Let's do some coding. Um, first of all, I, I start by creating a new directory. Go in it and for every project that I start, I also I create a, a Git repository even if I'm just um, doing it locally. And I start my projects with writing uh, README. 
giving some some name to the project i choose timeless for this one and the very least that should be present for any project is one or two sentences describing the project if you cannot describe the project you probably should uh, go back to to planning and think about what you what you're going to do and this should be a time handling package to showcase the beauty of Ruby. The very next that I do is adding some usage in the README so that I have an idea how the, the myself or some other user will end up using my package of my project. Uh, for this, we will have some Ruby code. We want to require our timeless package. And then we should be able to um, have methods like five days, five hours, combine them, five minutes, and also apply some from now to this um, result. And what we should result of is some kind of time that will be in the future, not necessary to specify here. Another thing that I, that I want to start with always is to think about the environment that I work in. Uh, which will result in so, some section about development. So if some other developer picks up the project, uh, he, he or she should at least know how to start. So um, there, the Ruby dependencies, Ruby packages are um, um, managed in so-called Ruby gems or gems in short. And there's a system-wide um, package manager that is called Gem. And with Gem, uh, you can install dependencies. Uh, however, I want to install them only on a project base. And there's a widely used um, package manager for, for local, so for project-based dependencies. And it is called Bundler. And with Bundler, when I have installed Bundler on my system, then I can run Bundler install on my um, repository and it will install all dependencies. We will also have write some tests. So in order to run these tests, you have to execute this statement. So Bundle exec ensures that the dependencies of the projects are loaded and Ruby tests will run all tests in the test directory. And for sure, um, we will also play around with our code. Um, therefore, we can use the interactive Ruby um, shell and require our timeless package. And also, we will build some example in the end that we also want to be able to run. Uh, for sure, on my system, I have already installed Bundler. So I can initialize um, a new bundle information here, which results in a gem file, also called gem file. And we're going to add at least one dependency. You don't have to take care for the first three lines. It's just about where to find the dependencies. And we want to include um, the um, test framework mini test which is really small, simple, but gives a lot of features. Um, I also want to have all my um, dependencies installed in this directory. So I configure Bundler to use the bus vendor bundle. And when I bundle install, it will fetch Minitest. And this is the only dependencies. and cool thing is Minitest has no other dependencies. Um, Bundler will create a log file, so our installed dependencies are pinned down to this specific version. And it also created the vendor directory where we can find our dependencies now. And I don't want to have the vendor directory in my git repository, so I add it to a git ignore. And the rest 
I can commit now. Ruby's, um, Ruby's embrace testing. And you probably won't find any um, widely used package that has not tests. So let's also start with some tests. And make a test directory. Uh, first thing we have to do is require a mini test and we want it to automatically find our tests. Additionally, we want a more colorful output. So we include this package and I write it just as a command, but we later have to um, include our timeless package again, uh, uh, also, so that our code is uh, included and it's enough to to create um, a class prefix with test and derive it from minitest and um, minitest with autorun will automatically find this test case and if any method in the class prefixed with test underline will be um, executed as a test. So, what we want to have is something like five days and we convert it to an integer so we can, can compare it easily and we will compare it to five times 25, 24 hours, 60 minutes, 60 seconds and it should result to the same thing. Um, now I can run my test, bundle exec ruby and it should fail because integer has no method days. Uh, we can even check this because um, I, I start another interactive Ruby shell and you can, you can inspect the objects at runtime. And for example, we can check five, the class of five. Five is an integer. Um, we can even check the public methods defined for this class. Let's close this window and we see, okay, five days, there is no five days. Um, as a cool example, there are other methods defined um, by default in Ruby core. For example, we have odd and even, so we can, this brings us back to the true false example. We can check if five is odd or even. Okay, so let's um, make our test work. So we create our timeless package itself. We start by defining a timeless module. So we have our closed namespace and don't mess with any other um, package or core functionality. And what we have if we use five dot days then we result in something that is kind of a duration. So I will name my class duration. And I need something to work internally with it. So I use the Ruby uh, construct, Ruby construct of a class to initialize it with seconds. So seconds will always be given to our duration and internally we want to uh, store seconds. This is a, a instance variable of this class or of this object that gets um, derived from the class and we store seconds so we can work with it. Uh, what we also want to have is um, a method days that can be accessed on class level. Self um, um, will result in that I instead of I have some object I can I can use the class itself and call days on it and give some integer. And with, if I, if I call days, then I want to want to initiate my uh, duration class. So I call new, so I get an instance. I provide the um, 
number I received and I simply multiply it with 24 times 60 times 60 for sure. What we also can do is like to save some effort to multiply it with the seconds. A seconds of a day. Next thing I want to have is I want to compare my uh, duration with some other duration. Therefore, we take the internal seconds and I make an exact compare. I take the other thing and I convert it to an integer. The 2e uh, method is some kind of convention as well. So if you define them, um, you should receive some integer object and it's up to you to define it. So let's also define it for us duration, uh, what we want to do if you call to integer, we result in seconds. What's missing now is we still cannot call days on an on a integer. Therefore, we open up the integer class. This is the core integer class and we extend it by defining a days method. And now we call our timeless package days and we uh, send self to it. Self because integer is already the, the value we want to work with. And as an alias, we define uh, day and days because we don't care if someone use day or days. It's okay to say one day or one days. Uh, it's just for better readability and an alias is perfectly fine for this case. What we now can do is run our tests again. And it does not uh, succeed because our package is still not included. Now it's done. Um, let's simply extend our functionality going back to the timeless package or start with the tests maybe better and also convert weeks. So let's say we have one week. We want to compare it simply to seven days. That's enough for this case because days is already tested. And we also want to have combinations. So we assert equal that for example, one week from now, minus 14 days results seven days ago. Back to our module. What we now have to do is we have to define weeks. We can simply copy and paste the uh, days method. Also al alias it for, for a singular case. And on the duration class, we need weeks as well. We get a number and for we could now, for example, do um, days to time seven and it will will result in the in a proper um, in a proper instance. Uh, we could also just write new and and figure out uh, seven times twenty four sixty or just use the, the number of seconds. So now our test should work again. Let's have a look. Ah, for this, I, I forgot to mention, there's also um, an internal where uh, on some cases, um, there's a second conversion to integer that uses to int. So we also write an alias because we make no difference in this case. And I'll execute tests just fail for one because we have no from now method for sure. 
So on, we can revisit the, the arrow message. Undefined method from now on timeless duration. So let's define it. On duration class, we want to have from now, and we also want to have a go. For this, we don't work any longer with durations because from now we'll reset in a specific timestamp. Therefore, we check time and we make a little trick here. We say we uh, use the time at, which takes any Unix, Unix timestamp, and we take the current time to integer, so it results also the seconds in Unix timestamp. And from now, um, we add the seconds that we got in our duration. And we also, uh, just to get safe, uh, to be safe, we um, um, define it to be in UTC, just to avoid issues with local time zones. And the same goes for Go, except that we want to have minus seconds instead of increase. Um, so let's run the tests again. And all work. As a final step, we want to recreate the statement from, from the slides. Therefore, I start with a new file, example. Uh, but first, uh, let's get back to gem file and add more dependencies because we actually also want to, to query some database. And therefore, I selected a Mongo database because it's really simple to set it up and um, don't need to define a scheme um, forward. So I use Mongo8, which is a Mongo, MongoDB database abstraction. And I also use a gem called Faker, which is really, really nice. It's a um, dummy data generators. So we can have some data that is more interesting. And what I also use is Spry, which is a debugger. Then we have to install our dependencies again, run panel install, which is now a lot of more because uh, especially the, the Mongo8 framework will need more dependencies for sure. Uh, we can also revisit gemfile.log to see, okay, it's much longer list now. And get back to just example file. Um, now we have to require Mongo8, require Baker, Pry, and also import our timeless package. First, I have to do some dirty work configuring the database. Default. Uh, I will start the local local MongoD database that I've prepared uh, using Botman. And it's um, it serves the database on port 27017. And I also need a database name. And I create um, a user model, includes the Mongo8 document, so it has all features of the Mongo8 document. I create the field name of type string, a field joint at of type time. And as I've already tried this example, several times. I will also make sure there is no data in the database uh, unless there, are, there is no data in the database. So user count is zero. Um, 
let's have some statement that we that we see what's going on. Generate we print generating test data. And we are going to create 500 users. So we go into a loop with five, 500 times. We create user create. And the name should be a random name from our faker name generator. Also joint at should be some random date in the last 14 days. And that we know where we are, we make a dot every time a user is created. And for the final user, we, oh, when, when we finished, we start a new line. Uh, last thing I have to do is to bind our debugger. So the debugger we fire out, fire up, and we can then interactively play with our data and we already have the user model defined. So let's give it a try. Ah. Ruby, it generates test data. Um, now I can check. Okay, we have 500 user. We pick up the last user, check the name of this user, and it's the Han Bunny Rolfson. Let's take the first, maybe the better name, Johnny Ratke. So, and now we want to query our data and say joint at greater than equal, let's say one day ago, and let's see how many users this are, 22. Um, we can plug their names and maybe also the, the joint date. And then we see, okay, now maybe also sort it, then it's easier to read. So order by joint at descending order. And we see these are all users that were created in the last um, day from our test data. The, the code we have just written was built for demonstrational purpose. If you want to start with Ruby, it might be a really bad idea that the first thing you do is manipulating its very basic objects. Uh, for this presentation, however, I think it was, was a quite good fit. If you like the short demonstration and you want to see more Ruby code, um, let me point you to some proper resources. This presentation, the slides, and all code, and even more than is shown, so more tests, more uh, methods on, on integer, is published at GitHub. Uh, currently, there are only 10 repositories showing up when you search, search for Ruby for the win. So I sh I'm sure you will find it quite quickly. You should um, visit Try Ruby on the official site of the language to get a guided tour and a nice playground in your web browser. Then you can have a look at Exorcism. Exorcism is an open source platform that supports you when you learn a programming language. It currently has around 50 language tracks uh, where you solve a task and then you get feedback from real people that are that are quite experts in the in the language given. You should note that those people are volunteers, and you should not be mad if it takes some time to get reviews on your solution. I follow this project since 2013, and I also contribute there as a mentor for several language tracks. So the chances are are good that you could receive some code review from me on your solution written in Ruby.
The next is Ruby on Rails. If you are into web development, uh, you should definitely browse through the guides of the Ruby on Rails framework, uh, which is the basis for websites like GitHub, GitLab, and Shopify. It is a, it's a huge collection of many packages that provide awesome Ruby code, and it also offers great ways to build uh, web applications. When you have spent some time with Ruby, it is time to, to meet its widely used static code analyzer, RuboCop. This tool will help you use and understand best practices from the Ruby community. And besides, it is a really great project and it bundles so much knowledge. For me, it took quite some time to stop hating this tool and get the value behind. So, don't give up easily and check it out. I'm Christoph and I use unused as nickname in the Linux Tag RC channel at OFTC and you can find me also at GitHub with the username unused. If you want to contact me after the event, you will probably find some email address when duck duck going my name, but the easiest way is to write on Twitter where I go with the username Liptagut. Uh, big thanks for the Linux Target team for organizing this, away, this event, and many thanks for joining my talk. I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Christoph. That was a really awesome talk. Uh, I really enjoyed it myself. So I've looked into Ruby a couple of years ago, um, but um, with such a talk, I probably would have stayed longer because that was really impressive, especially like how easy it is to um, yeah, make really nicely readable statements. So re really, Thanks. really great. Um, I haven't seen any questions yet in IRC, um, but since, since we have time, um, I'll say we wait a couple of minutes and see if something else, uh, someone shows up. Oh, there's a question. Um, so, um, Meister Luke asks, how do you compare Ruby dependency management to Python? Well, I, I, I had troubles with Python. I never had troubles with Ruby, which is a lie, but I, I don't think I can easily compare it because um, I'm, I think both is great. Uh, but I, my, my knowledge is better in, in Ruby than in, in PIP, so in, in Bundler and, and Gems, and which is also, also counts for, for what I'm doing is uh, also managing the Ruby version, like with there, there are tools like Arbenf and, and others where you can uh, set the proper Ruby version for your project. It automatically switches the Ruby version, and then you also install the dependencies into this uh, version so you can uh, reuse them or also do it on a, on a project level and this r really goes very very smooth and I did very rarely have troubles with dependencies. The only thing that uh, happened one time was people uh, deleting dependencies which is for sure can happen in any language and for sure it's the code of someone else and if it is open source it should be should be very fine. But uh, it's impressive how fast the Ruby community was reacting uh, with such situation. Well, because I know, like in JavaScript, this is not good. Um, yes. H hard to compare. I'm sorry that I cannot go into details that much. <laughs> yeah. Um... I guess it's also, um, well, it's different languages that have, have different philosophies, so even the package management might have different philosophies. Yes. So there's another question, um, again, a comparison question. What do you think that Ruby does better than Python? Uh, I like the style much better. This is, it, it feels more natural to me writing in Ruby. 
Um, I mostly use Python because um, nowadays everything you do with machine learning is just way advanced in Python and especially if you do some data analysis, um, you, you, you will be way faster, but still I use a combination of both. And I think for, for a long time Ruby had uh, some troubles with performance, which is now quite good because <clears throat> like 10 years ago, it was really bad. And this was also a target for Ruby 3.0, which uh, was released um, this year, beginning this year. And it tried to, to increase the performance from the versions 10 years ago to uh, three times that fast. And it, for most performance uh, benchmarks that I've seen, it worked and works well. Um, but still, uh, when I when I use, when I create some some ser small services, then uh, I still stick with Python because I think it's it's not that much of a resource overhead. Because if you if Ruby starts to grow, can be challenging. Still, it's pretty fine. So I I don't have uh, troubles, and I use it on a large scale. Yeah. Okay. I think it's also a, a question, right? It's not what is better, but it's what is better for the for the job you have, right? Using the yes. right tool for the right exactly. job. Exactly. That, that's what I wanted to point out with using tools, because I think uh, one thing that that really gets me all the time when I'm using Ruby is uh, revisiting some old codes and looking at the code and finding out how how elegant I solved some problem. Because you 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 forget, you know that the basic functionality of your code, but you forget about how you solved some problem and you revisit it and you if you real if you like your old code then you know the language is quite good yeah that's that's a, that's a, that's, a, that's a good idea to look at your own code yeah if you like it then that's probably because the language was good in the first place <laughs> the, the the question from master look i've opened the ic from before and uh, is it justified to um uh, patch basic objects no it's baked, basically this is seen as, as monkey patching. So patching is, is always a very bad practice seen in Ruby. So you can do it if you have really a tiny fix for something that someone, so a, a classic monkey patch that you say, okay, some, some maintainers do not want to include your fix for a problem, then it's okay to open up some, some objects and batch them. Uh, for the example that I've given, I'm not changing anything from, from the integers themselves, I just extend them. This is kind of okay, but still this was why I'm warning about this. It's a, not a good idea if you start with Ruby. You can do this, you, have, you should um, keep it at the very minimum and but then it's it's pretty fine, and a lot of Remax do it. But it it make it should make really sense and should fit the situation. And you have to double think if you, if no other package would um, would overwrite your code. So it could also happen because, for example, um, what I was extracting is from uh, Ruby on Rails, and if you include the Ruby on Rails packages. Uh, they actually will overwrite your code and you will use, use them um, a mixture, which is kind of really bad. And uh, the, the other question was, uh, can I modify methods of built-in types? Yes, you can, but you should not. That's the, the big things. You can basically change anything, but it's a bad idea. So that's why you should not work on the on the basic objects level. Yeah, I guess um, changing the way an object works um, is always a bad idea because then your code does something that other Ruby developers would not expect. So. Yes. Okay. Let's see if we have any more questions. Okay, doesn't look like it. 
Um, thank you again, Gustav. Very, uh, very nice talk. Um, um, as I said, I totally enjoyed that. So um, thank you from for me personally and from Katar Nuxtage for uh, for this um, awesome talk. Thank yeah. you. Very kind. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Then. Bye. Bye. Thanks.